so um, we have four panelists today. Uh, um, ethnicity is something which is a very conf uh, is a very broad uh, uh, and I hope that the panelists that we have today help us cover uh, and understand a bit about ethnicity. Uh, so the first uh, the first panelist is Prabhavati Chingambam. She's a cosmologist working at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, she's originally from Manipur. Uh, she finished her PhD in theoretical physics from Jamia and then did her postdoctoral research at Harish Chandra Research Institute, Allahabad, and then at Korea Institute of Advanced Study, Seoul. Uh, since 2010, she's a faculty at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. She would be the first panelist to speak. Uh, after her would be uh, Shanta Leshram. Uh, Shanta Leshram is also from Manipur. Uh, after his uh, schooling and college from Manipur, he uh, joined the TIFR Bombay for his PhD. Uh, then he went to uh, then he went to uh, the University of Waterloo, Canada, for his uh, postdoctoral fellow as a postdoctoral fellow, and then was an academic visitor to Max Planck Institute, Bonn, and ETH Juris. Currently, is a faculty in the uh, Indian Institute of uh, Indian Statistical Institute, Delhi. Uh, before this, he was a faculty at ICER Bhopal. His research interests are number theory and cryptography, but apart from that, he's also involved in mathematical Olympiad activities and mentors students at different levels. The third panelist would be Sunazaria Mins, who is the vice chancellor of Sido Kanu Murmu University, Dumka. Uh, before this appointment, she was a professor of computer science department of the, uh, in, in JNU, Delhi. She did, schooling, she did her schooling in Jharkhand and then her college in Chennai and Bangalore. Uh, apart from JNU, she has also taught at universities of Madurai and Bhopal. Her research interests are spatial and data analysis, AI and machine learning, and big data analysis. She's also the president of the JNU Teachers Association and has played many administrative roles in, in it. Um, our fourth speaker would be Virginius Khaka. Uh, he's, he's, he's originally from North Bengal, studied at the Pune University for his post-graduation, and then did his PhD from IIT Kanpur. He has taught at various universities and institutes like the Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, Delhi School of Economics, and Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Guwahati, which he started. As a researcher, he's interested in sociological concerns of plantation laborers, uh, tribal communities, agrarian structure and development, and social exclusion and marginalization and has published many books and articles on this. So uh, these are our panelists. Um, I would like to say a few things um, about my own understanding of ethnicity and discrimination before I uh, hand it over to the panelists. Uh, so whenever I think about experience with discrimination, I somehow think of instances of people discriminating against, discriminating against people because of their gender, class, caste, ethnicity. But then there are times that these instances of discrimination happen because basically the system is discriminatory towards marginalized communities. So um, I would like, like these are certain, certain of my experiences outside to ethnic discrimination. Uh, when I was working in Shahapur, uh, uh, the predominantly tribal block of Madhya Pradesh, I met a lot of young tribal girls and boys, mostly girls, uh, who could not take mathematics or economics, a, a subject of their choice, because the colleges were very far from the geographically remote villages. Uh, in Bhopal, there were young Pardi, which is a denotified tribe, children who were made to leave school because of insults and discrimination by teachers and classmates because of their zat. Uh, I have also met a classmate who nearly lost his admission to a reputed university because his previous university, which came from a very was, was in a very politically problem a, a politically troubled state could not give him his degree certificates because it was closed because of political tensions and this university was insistent that he gives a degree certificate um, in shahpur i met a lot of children who were fluent in three languages like porku gondi and katlu but were very ashamed to acknowledge it rather were ashamed of it in contrast to urban child whose parents would be very proud to have a 10 year old who is fluent in three languages uh, so uh, I feel that some of these discriminations are systemic and some of these discriminations are personal. But the ones which are personal also have a sanction or encouragement from the system. Like in the case of Pardi children, where the state allows the ch people to call them names by tagging them decriminalized and then at every pretext arresting them for crimes that they have not been committed. Today in our panel, we have panelists who have seen both these types of instances. But there are also people who have been in positions 
where they could resist discrimination and support people who are discriminated against. And it would be nice to know a bit of these. So I hand it over to Prabhavati. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Ah, yeah. So thank you very much, Aloka, for your wonderful introduction. Uh, I completely agree with your statement on uh, you know, personal and systemic uh, discrimination. It's quite structural. So uh, today, so I'm not really an expert to speak on uh, you know various aspects of it, but what I would like to do today is to focus on my personal experiences, which will be kind of personal. And uh, like you said, the personal becomes, uh, becomes structural when it goes to the political arena. So I would like to focus on my personal experiences. So what I will do is I will first place myself uh, within the Northeast. So I belong to the Northeast, uh, you know, which is a group of various ethnicities, actually. It's like a Micro you can think of it as a microcosm of India in, in terms of diversity of uh, ethnic groups, languages, and religions. So I will first place myself within that context. Then I will uh, talk about a little bit about my uh, personal journey, uh, focusing on uh, academia, how I landed, landed up to be an academic, to, to be in the place where I am today. Uh, and uh, what are the lessons that I learned from it? So these are the things I would like to draw out. And then I would like to ask the question whether from, from the time when I was a student, has the situation improved? So this is something I will answer only based on uh, conversations with other people and you know, newspaper reports because uh, I, I am quite guilty of the fact that I have been cut off from, you know, from these kind of issues for some time because I was too much focused on my uh, research. And, uh, and the last point that I will make will be, uh, you know, by summarizing from this, how can we be more inclusive of ethnic minorities? So I will, uh, uh, that would be the last uh, point I will mention. So let's start from um, placing myself. So we all agree that uh, in academia and in society, diversity is good. So by hiring me, my institution has ticked two boxes. That is representation of ethnic minority uh, because I belong to a minority in the context of India and representation of women. So how did I get to be here? So the, the topics that we are discussing, you know, in, in these, there have been five discussion sessions so far. There are words like hurdle, again, Indian academia, ethnic minority. So my life, my academic career part has uh, uh, intersections of these. So uh, in doing so, in telling this story, I would like to highlight the stories of maybe many more like me. Uh, and, and probably the hurdles that I face are not as, as, uh, as big as many that other people have faced. And I, I'll focus on what steps for improvement can, can be learned from this. So I think my, from my perspective, the hurdles that I faced, particularly during my college days and the time I finished PhD, they were far from invisible. They were like really hard. Okay. So uh, within the Northeast, I mentioned already, it is uh, really a big, uh, you know, it's like a melting pot of many different cultures, groups, religion, languages. So I come from Imphal uh, and uh, in Manipur. So I belong to the Maitre community. I am not a tribal at least the majority of the Métis, they are not categorized as scheduled tribes. Uh, I believe that uh, a couple of decades ago, Métis got included in the list of uh, OBCs, maybe that was around 1995. I don't recollect the exact uh, date, year. And all my life, I have competed in the general category. So in the context of India, I belong to an ethnic minority, but in my own state, I belong to the majority community. Okay. So, so a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, how I landed up in uh, Indian Science Academia. So uh, I did my schooling till class 10 in Manipur. So I was very fortunate, I think, uh, that there were a few, a, a few factors which uh, I count as, you know, it was fortunate for me that helped me land up in, uh, in science and in academics. 
So my uh, interest in research was sparked uh, sometime in middle school. I, I did not know or I did not think about what I would like to become and so on in the future. I just knew that I liked mathematics. And uh, I think the reason for this, because I was fortunate that I had a neighbor who was a brother of, who was a friend of my brother, and he was studying mathematics in college. And he would, uh, during the uh, vacation periods, he would give me uh, mathematics problems, which was a little tougher than what I had in class. And he would just say, okay, you go and think about it and you solve it, come, come back to me. So I, I, I had my taste of, uh, you know, of enjoying research during those days. And uh, I, I think my subsequent career part was set already at that time, though I did not know it. Then I was also fortunate that I went to a school which was all girls. Uh, I, I say fortunate because because of the fact that uh, uh, in my school, because of the fact that it was all girls, there was uh, no question of being compared with boys and you know, comments like, uh, you as a girl cannot do science or mathematics. I, at least I don't recollect ever hearing these kind of comments. And um, the third thing was there, of course, my parents were, they just let me be. They did not force anything on me. So I was very fortunate uh, and I would say I, uh, it, this is like a privileged upbringing. And within Manipur, it is certainly privileged because I was in the majority community. Okay, so then uh, I went to college to, to, actually I went to finish my school, secondary school in Delhi and subsequently did college there and PhD. Uh, so you can ask why Delhi? Because uh, at that time, you see, this was, I went, in the late 80s to, to finish secondary school. And insurgency was on the rise in Manipur. Manipur was in turmoil. So education, schools, colleges, they were frequently disrupted. And uh, the perception at that time was that Delhi has good educational institutions. And so it, I think my generation was the, uh, was the, was the time, it was a time when uh, parents, who, even parents who could barely afford to send their children, just send them, you know, managing somehow, send them to study outside Manipur to get a good education and have a good future. So uh, in, in this context, I think Shanta's, I don't know if he will speak about it, but Shanta's contribution and he, what he says will be very interesting because he belongs to the next generation after me. And uh, he did college in, in uh, Manipur. So I, I'm quite eager to hear about his experience. So, and so this began, this journey to Delhi, this began, this was a, a very, very rude shock. And people were very, very hostile. And uh, uh, I was not prepared for this because uh, uh, nobody had warned me that it was going to be like this. And uh, the generally, the general population, the belief was that I was inferior. You know, it was in their body language, it's in the, the way they talk to you. Uh, it, was, it was very shocking. So it was on a, you know, on a daily basis, we would be hearing uh, racial abuse. We would be facing racial abuse. Uh, and we were, you know, words like ching chong, chinky, or even Nepali, you know, spoken, you know, expressed in a very derogatory way would be uh, said to us. And this was mostly by men, but there were women also who did it. So I, I want to mention one incident when I had gone to Ames because my little niece was ill. So I was standing in the queue when an old lady came to me and started screaming. And she said, the word she said was, tum log chale jao, tum log kutta khate ho. Okay. So uh, I was very embarrassed at the moment, at that time, uh, because uh, like uh, it was attracting a lot of attention to me. And, uh, but even though this was my initial reaction, I remember I was really very angry afterwards. So I did, I, I think I developed the very thick skin to manage all this. Uh, and uh, I think in the consequence, I also became quite aggressive behavior because I had to handle, fight aggression with aggression. But uh, I, I uh, even, I think till today, I have this feeling of insecurity and vulnerability. Uh, I have not been really able to overcome this. And then there was the added dimension that, you know, I was a woman from the Northeast. And of course, with all the labels that go with that, so it was hard. Uh, then at the institution level, the bias was probably not so good, but it was there. 
it was in the attitude and the uh, subtle things that uh, teachers would say or in the hostel uh, it was it was there so um, so i want to pinpoint to what i think you know helped me through because uh, clearly i did not give up and i i i went ahead and i became an academic so what saw me through this period were i think two factors the first was that i had excellent support group of friends from the northeast uh, so uh, we helped and protected each other. So there was also students unions which looked out for the interests of the students. I, I think this is very important, the support group. And secondly, also, so I, I mentioned earlier that I kind of had a privilege in you know, school and childhood. And I think the, uh, the self-belief that was instilled at that time was uh, helpful in, in seeing me through this period. And also, you know, it's like, okay, if things really get worse, I, I always have my you know, home state to go back to. And I, I, I would believe many people, most people would not have this luxury. Uh, so the most of the, my generation who has studied in Delhi and other cities, I would say that they return to their home states after completing their studies. And I think things change subsequently in the, in the next uh, generations. So now uh, what I want to ask is what would have made it easier for me? and other students who were you know, people from the Northeast. I think what would have helped was better institutional support. At that time, there was, there was I mean, almost zero institutional support. Maybe the access to legal help, and certainly more hostels. So I was in the hostel, I, uh, I was lucky, but uh, many students from the Northeast were staying outside on rent, and I think uh, they spent, uh, you know, most of their energies are surviving, rather than focusing on their on the, on the studies and it, it's not surprising that many uh, returned to look for a better life at home uh, then i will i will just uh, uh, the next phase of my life was postdoc life so i was lucky that i had mentors who were supportive and then i became a faculty so i don't since i don't want to take too much time let me move on to the uh, third third uh, point that I, I want to make so the question I want to ask is, has the situation improved from my time? So my time means started in the early 90s and I left Delhi in 2002. Uh, so since that time, what has changed? So I think uh, when I read, uh, when I speak to people and I read uh, papers, or what or, I mean, the news that is reported, I think there is a lot of cause for serious concern. Uh, on the surface, it would appear that institutional support has improved. For example, I was just Googling and I found that uh, several of the Delhi University colleges have uh, Northeast cells, which are meant to promote harmony among different student communities. But uh, I am not sure, or uh, well, I don't know enough to comment on whether they have been effective. Maybe uh, other panelists can shed light on that. So it looks on, on paper at least that it has improved. Uh, however, the so we all know that you know social injustice uh, against ethnic minorities has been on the rise. So uh, there have there have been many instances of northeast uh, students getting murdered during the last decade. Some names uh, you know probably you have all read about them: Vidhu Tanya from Arunachal, Richard Loitam from Manipur. I'm just naming you know three which come to my to my head: uh, Heshu Bernard from Manipur. So it, it looks like the level of conflict uh, has only increased, it looks like that. So at least in my time, you know, we did not hear of murder. There was racial abuse and so on, maybe occasional fights and all that, but uh, I, I, at least I don't recall hearing stories of murder. So today when I talk to young people from the Northeast who are in various places, there are a lot of stories of kindness from the local population as well as injustice. But I, I find that the stories of injustices are basically overwhelm the stories of kindness. So, uh, you know, even now in the, in the pandemic, I'm sure uh, people have heard of the attacks on the Northeast people. So it looks like things have gotten worse. So I am now, uh, after telling you uh, about all this, I, will, uh, I would like to end by um, uh, summarizing, you know, what are the lessons that I have learned from my own personal journey and how can it be used to help 
you know, become more inclusive of, of uh, ethnic minorities. Okay, so uh, to summarize the, the factors that have helped me join academia. So I, had, I was lucky that I had somebody who sparked my interest and I had a conducive environment in home and school. Uh, so there was a support group of friends in college and supportive mentors. Okay, so, so having said this, Okay, so having said this, uh, even though I have been speaking about my personal experience, uh, I believe that the, what we go through at an individual, uh, individual level, the inferior tra treatments and so on, uh, discriminations on a personal level, they build up and they manifest as structural operation at the political level. So what I would suggest is, you know, the government has to remove laws like Armed Forces Special Powers Act, engage the public in decision making, have more trust, have more respect for the people, local people. And you know, don't go around buying MLAs. Okay, that's the, the first point. Second point is uh, at, the, at the personal level, to my colleagues and to the population at large, I would say, please have an open mind. And please recognize that society is, has been very unequal. It has, we are all very insular. So I often hear people say that the people from Northeast hang around amongst themselves only, make no effort to mingle. It may be true, it may not be true. Uh, but uh, my personal belief is that this is a, more of a cultural trait than, than you know, actually wanting to be amongst themselves. And in this regard, I, I think that the onus is more on the majority people to make the minority feel at ease. Uh, and the third point I want to make is that reservation has helped. Uh, so I, please don't dilute it. And, and the fourth point is please in, improve uh, in educational infrastructure in each state so that there is local access to quality education so that you know people don't have to go to other states to study. Uh, then on the issue of diversity in hiring, so I think there have the, the institution have to be, uh, I come more specifically to, to, uh, to academia when I, when I talk about this. Uh, I think uh, there should be more effort to, for diverse hiring. And in this context, one thing that we, me, myself included, as you know, somebody from the Northeast who has become part of academia can do is, uh, so in, in the last uh, in the discussion, one uh, panelist talked about role models. So, so I think uh, the role that we can play in this, in this context is that we can be mentors and we can nurture talent. We can identify talent, nurture, and you know, help them through. Uh, and this can feed into the diversity of uh, hiring. Uh, this means that we have to be out there and interact. Excuse me. So uh, we have to interact and uh, hopefully ignite interest in young people and help them at various stages of academic life. And this is a relatively long-term commitment. And uh, so I come to the last, uh, uh, last statement that I would like to make. Please take this on a light note. Uh, you know, in Delhi, when, uh, in my experience has been that the local population would talk to me as Tumlok, Tumlok all the time, okay? And now, even today, in, within, amongst my own circle of friends, I often hear, you people. So, you people, is it true that you people are like this? Is it true that you people are like that? So, what I would like to say is that this is very jarring to hear. And uh, in my mind, it immediately erects a wall between us. So please refrain from doing that. So I would like to end here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Prabhavati. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, Shanta, would you want to, uh, will you? Shanta, are you there? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so then, okay, thank you, Aloka and Aniket and others. 
Yeah, I say, yeah, I say, probably alcohol is say because in Manipur, the elder persons we actually call by, I guess, sister or brother. So it means sister. So I know, I know, it's a probability for quite some time. Anyway, so she, uh, she has mentioned quite a bit about some experience which has, which has some similarities with me. But I'd like to give my own personal perspective and talk about later on some kind of uh, uh, experiences which I fed, faced or, I mean, I haven't really discriminated, I mean, uh, real discrimination towards me, but I mean, I've been quite lucky in that sense, but let me share with my experiences. So like, uh, like her, actually, I'm also from Manipur, from the Maiti community, but I'm from a rural area called Kangabok, which is in a different district from Imphal. And from my, I mean, I've been in Navodaya Vidyalaya, which is, which are central schools and the Ministry of Human Resource Development, uh, from the department, uh, this Ministry of Human Resource Go Development, Government of India. So I've been here yeah, from my class six onwards till 12, I studied in Navodaya. That way, I was sort of introduced from a kind of sort of independent uh, stay or uh, kind of staying with my friends uh, like from 6 to 12 in a residential campus. So I was not really homesick that way and that also helped me in uh, my, uh, help me whenever I go to, in settling down in any place wherever I go uh, after that. And after plus two at the time actually in Manipur we had because of the insurgency problem we had a lot of disturbances particularly in college uh, levels the exams could not be held in time or it used to be delayed for example the three-year degree course it used to take four years and so on by the time you get degree everything so uh, and I uh, my family I mean we are not from financially good background so my father, though I wanted to study in Delhi, that I actually, like many of my friends and con contemporaries, so I wanted to be in a, a civil servant at that time. So, uh, and I wanted to study in Delhi uh, because Delhi was kind of a preferred destination for many of my friends, my seniors, and uh, whoever wants to um, go to civil services. So, uh, but somehow I, knew I couldn't afford to go. Then I studied in Manipur uh, in the M College of Science. Luckily, I had some very good teachers, and because I was interested in maths, so I started continued maths there. So in between, we used to have disruption in classes because of the burns, blockades, etc. But uh, yeah, it really affected our studies. But uh, luckily, we had extra classes, and I used to study on my own. And so it didn't affect me that much. But of course, quite a few of my friends and others were affected. Then I, uh, I stumbled ac across this mathematics training and talents program, uh, which is a kind of a summer program for mathematics started by Professor Kumarison, where in fact I met a local so there, uh, Niket, so there, I mean, we all met there, we became friends there. And that actually introduced me to, to I mean, the world of math uh, mathematics in the sense that I wanted to be a mathematician after attending that. And then after BSc, I actually got selected in TIFR uh, for PhD. By the time, actually, my third year exams were not over. And uh, because I was supposed to get uh, my third years, but my, so I joined my plus two in 1997. And in 2000, I was to get my BSc degree. But uh, actual exams were held in April 2001. So I joined TIFR in between then took leave and came back and wrote my third year exam and went back to TFR to continue my PhD. And uh, luckily, uh, I've been in these institutions and uh, like I was in Manipur till PSC, then I was in TFR. So I didn't somehow, didn't, uh, I didn't face any discrimination so, so far. And in fact, I was, I mean, lucky, I was lucky to have many good friends and other seniors who helped me at many stages. So, I was lucky in that way, but uh, I came across many of um, many other people who really faced discrimination either in Mumbai or in Delhi. So after PhD, actually, I went abroad and came back. Then I, yeah, I came to Delhi directly for my uh, my faculty position where I'm currently in Indian Indian Statistical Institute. So, uh, and I heard a lot about uh, discrimination in Delhi, extra, but uh, somehow because since 
whenever I go to uh, anywhere and when they know that I'm a professor, so they don't, they treat me in a different way. So I was not really, I mean, uh, except at minor cases somewhere here and there, but I've never had real discriminations. But I've seen that in the Delhi, though uh, now it seems to be better on the paper side as the professor mentioned, but I hear a lot of cases of uh, racial discrimination at different places where they say, I mean, uh, if you, I mean, uh, where they say sort of, uh, there are different pockets, like in Delhi University, North Campus area, there are certain places like Vijayanagar, where a lot of students from Manipur and North East uh, there, or, or even Munika in South Delhi, uh, extra where I hear something about this racial, uh, racial discrimination from time to time. But luckily, because of internet and uh, network, uh, network of this notice, uh, different groups, etc. So uh, there are proactive groups helping in to uh, uh, to make this uh, to help when when students or other people are I mean really discriminated. Though it's still on the I mean uh, it's still the problem is persisting. So, uh, but uh, whenever but then. At my level, what, what I've been sort of trying to do is that whenever I meet any students or any people, I've been telling them about different opportunities. And so far, in fact, I also help some of these groups, uh, groups sometimes in terms of either funds or sometimes in the meeting so that at least uh, we talk to them. And uh, also in kind of, uh, uh, what to say, uh, like we have this different guy, like there's a daily students, uh, like students union of Delhi and so there's a different uh, community, I mean, organizations who are taking active, uh, proactive care to actually help this. So these are some of the uh, issues faced at different levels, not just in academics, but in different levels. So one of the main reasons what I think that uh, students face is that when uh, in Manipur, like unless you study in central schools, you're not, I mean, like Hindi is not compulsory till 10. After, uh, up to eight class, people study Hindi, then nine, ten, I mean, you don't study Hindi, I, neither do people speak Hindi. And then by the time they come out of Manipur, I mean, particularly in North India, because there are more interviews in, in to Hindi, so sometimes because of one thing is this language issue, and other thing is about the food habits and different look. So, and uh, sometimes this culture shocks. So many of them, they have difficulty settling down. And, that is, and also at the same time, there's a misconception from people from different uh, community who doesn't know much about it. And uh, yeah, they think that you're, I mean, I mean, they don't know much about Manipur. In, in fact, I, in fact I, when I talk to some of people who are supposed to be well educated and they doesn't seem to know much about Manipur, they think that Manipur is probably part of Assam or something. I mean, Assam, of course, everyone knows by the name, though, though they may not know much about it, but many people doesn't seem to know about, so that, that there are different seven states in the Northeast, the sub, and, uh, excluding Sikkim, and that every state, they speak different language, different culture, everything. So this kind of thing, we need to actually, uh, the government, uh, at the, I mean, at institutional level, the government should take more active role to sort of educate people on this. One way is to introduce this ethnic curriculum or I mean, or about stories or history or even geographical, I mean, geography though something is there, but about history and how this, you think, uh, what are different, my, I mean, groups in notice and uh, stories about them or more history about them. If this introduced then it is, Students, if they get to learn something, then when they meet people from a different, uh, like ethnic minority from maybe from Nordis or somewhere else, they will at least feel that, okay, they have, if they've learned something about it in textbooks, then they will have a different approach. That's what I feel. And another thing what, uh, uh, what I actually feel is that uh, when, uh, like, uh, so, Particularly, like in colleges or uh, in colleges or even some universities, where suppose there are very few ethnic minorities, maybe not necessarily from notice, but from different places even. So, if the teachers or the administration they take proactive role, it will really help in uh, bridging the gap about this uh, kind of 
different about uh, a gap between different communities. For example, like suppose in a class of say 50, there are few like two, three or maybe few students from a different group. That if the students, some uh, the teacher somehow sort of shows them in, I mean, like tell them that they're from this uh, different group, and in fact, uh, they're and ask them to share their experience and so that they are uh, we're all part of India, but uh, people speak different languages and sort of, I mean, if this introduced well, then I think there will be more in inclusion. It's not that many of the time this discrimination, so different attitude happen because people doesn't know. When uh, it friends, when you know each other, then people are really helpful. I have actually in Delhi, when I came across people earlier, if they didn't know, but later on when you start knowing and then people are very helpful in that way. So most of the time, this, uh, these things happen because people doesn't know what it, people are ignorant. So because sometimes ignorant, uh, ignorance thinks that people are different or I mean, they have different views. But sometimes you don't hear, you have a limited knowledge either from newspapers or from fake news or whatever or from different things. And that, uh, then you have a different kind of idea about what's happening there. But once you meet the people and once you know the history, then your uh, outlook also changes. So that's what we, we really need to do it. And now thanks to internet, of course, uh, people are, I, I guess, more aware. I mean, still, uh, still though, I mean, uh, still there are a lot of, I mean, uh, there are many people who doesn't know about it, but luckily, uh, there's a lot of support system from different communities, like in particularly Manipur, for example, either Maitai who are majorities or uh, other tribals, or I mean, uh, like Manipur is a close knit community. If you know someone, then it's easy to know, like you know some, uh, it's easy, I mean, by like by induction or so, I mean, you keep knowing, uh, you you know more people and somehow they form a close knit community. And thanks to internet and Facebook and other social media now, uh, there's a good support system and one should take this potential and sort of try to uh, showcase uh, the history or the story about this notice in particular or other ethnic minorities in general and so that in general uh, like at least the education institutes the students should be more uh, made aware of this uh, different communities different uh, different groups, different reasons, so that at least there will be more assimilation. I think that will help in this kind, uh, at least help in some way. I cannot talk about outside the education institute, then it's a bit more difficult, but at least in the education institutes, these are some of the things we can do. But, uh, and as Mr. Prabhu also mentioned, we still, I mean, we still have a long way to go to really, uh, I mean, solve this problem. I mean, it still is improving, but uh, still we have a long way to go. And uh, on my personal side, actually, uh, I've been uh, like when I go home, I, when I, whenever possible, I talk to students. Then I, about this career, what are opportunities? Then uh, if they're selected, I mean, what are options in sciences, in mathematics, or even other areas? And if if they get selected, what what they do? And at least I share my personal experiences. And some of these uh, students when they come come out. I think uh, they still, some of them still keep in touch with me and they feel safer and they, uh, they get to sort of adjust a bit more. But there are many students who somehow come for the first time. For them, it's both cultural shock and may, in many hostels, they don't have this. I mean, they're purely vegetarian and they're, they crave for a different food and first of all, they need to, they, are, they crave for their own food or even non best food. And sometimes they have this, uh, they have different problems. So. This thing happened, but I think adjustment uh, from both sides is required. But uh, particularly since uh, our students are coming out more, they have to adjust a bit more. So, uh, so to make the adjustment, at least the government should uh, make certain sort of interventions in different way as kind of curriculum or, or at least at, I mean, sort of different hostel. Or, I mean, luckily in Delhi, there's this. But not this police cell is there who is helping at certain level. But I think still one is to have more, uh, or to say, um, yeah, more interaction with locals and more awareness campaigns. So that so we have uh, in India there are different 
we are a diverse nation. We have different groups, different uh, ethnic minorities, and so on. So I think if it's, I mean, so the at least with local groups, local organizations, and so on, if it's conducted, then it would at least help in some way uh, to bridge the gap. So I think that's all I want to say. Oh, thank you, Shanta. Uh, uh, I request uh, Professor Sonazaria means to uh, uh, Professor Mins, are you yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Aniket and Aloka, uh, and the, my esteemed panelists. Uh, it was it is nice to hear Prabha and also see Shanta for the first time. Whereas uh, Professor Khaka has been a senior to me, and uh, in more in many respects, uh, I I look up to his trails as to you know which way I, even I take decisions and otherwise. So uh, to all, the, um, yeah, greetings to all the four, uh, three panelists and also the organizers. Thank you for uh, this evening's uh, this panel discussion and session and all the participants. Um, yes, the, the the theme, I think the running theme is very, very interesting as uh, you mentioned, the invisible hurdles. And as Prabha has already mentioned that the hurdles are but invisible. Um, they are rather visible and more loud and blatant. Um, I think there isn't any perception issue in this regard when I say the, the hurdles are not invisible. They may be invisible to one or the other, only those who are in the state of den denial, but uh, they are not really invisible is what I would like to start with, the, the, my premise. At the outset, I would not like to repeat uh, what Prabha and Shanta have mentioned. Uh, sorry, I'm calling you by <laughs> your first names. Uh, yeah, because I think mo most of us have similar stories to share and we have some of the similar indicator, uh, indications, but. Uh, you know, um, I would like, I would try to not repeat. Uh, the, the, my methodology is going to be same again. Like, you know, um, I would like to um, uh, touch upon my own experiences also um, uh, in order to substantiate I would like what I want to say. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and so I would like to bring in my uh, experiences as a Adivasi kid because I come from uh, one of the Central Indian tribes, uh, Oran tribe. Uh, I grew up in uh, Ranchi, the, uh, the capital uh, city of uh, Jharkhand, the state. But it was a very, very small town when I, I grew up in uh, part of erstwhile Bihar. Um, uh, for various uh, reasons, political and otherwise, that area was very, very, uh, had very minimal facility, including no electricity in the town when we were studying as children. And even when I finished my 10th, we had to, I mean, the, the amenities or the basic necessities were so poor that even, uh, after two, even if the lights were switched on, we had to use a lamp to study. So that's the kind of uh, you know, infrastructural uh, um, situation was there when I grew up in this place. Um, but then for 40 years now, I have been outside the state of uh, Jharkhand and only uh, it's today is the 30th day I'm back to Jharkhand. Um, yeah, I left the, the, this, uh, this part uh, as a student to, to study outside my state, uh, especially because uh, sessions were late. And if I had to uh, go beyond my school and do something, because I, it seems I had decided to be a maths teacher uh, while I was pretty young, uh, 11 years. Uh, so I was pretty definite about that. And th that decision also came uh, because my parents would share that there aren't good maths teachers among tribals, which meant a lot because the tribal students were uh, not... Um, they, they, they were all, they were all possible hurdles that were uh, uh, brought uh, in uh, before them, so that they could, they could study, so that they could become uh, good teachers. Or there were teachers who were not fair and uh, did did equal treatment, and so any unequal treatment I consider as discrimination to begin with. Um, 
so uh, so uh, now that was my experience as a child too but what i hear um this was my report from a student in kerala who has been interacting with the tribes in vainadu i mean she she during her quarantine has been in that area and she has interacted and this is literally a second hand but a first hand second hand information that even to date the tribal children in the schools are bullied i mean this i'm talking about is the situation of vainadu okay they are bullied to the extent that they leave school okay there must be various reasons why they are bullied uh, as shanta was also mentioning probably it's our features uh, in case of uh, us who come from central india and especially in north our names also defy uh, so there are various uh, visible things which uh, which which uh, which make discrimination possible uh, or unequal treatment possible and so um, uh, now i think when i left uh, jharkhand way back in 1980 to to do my puc and then my entire education was outside here uh, outside and my uh, also um, uh, serving in uh, the three universities before coming to the fourth university in my career um what i had to do is to become invisible in the sense not stand out well i could be outstanding and i don't have to be outstanding but then i need should not have been standing out to be identified so that i invited unequal treatment and uh, i think this was a second reason why uh, it was a family decision that me and i have three uh, other sisters we did not come to the north indian cities of higher education Uh, because as uh, prabha and shanta have mentioned the delhi used to be the sort of the destination for people to study as well as i hear the bhu has been another university some would also go to calcutta and etc you see but then this is these are the places where we become more visible to invite unequal treatment and uh, i'm i'm sure prabha and shanta would uh, agree with me uh, because the same holds true for uh, our friends uh, and, and students who come from uh, northeast um in the places where we get identified so our our physical features uh, which are part of um, the reason why we get unequal treatment now um the second thing i want to talk about how the children or especially the tribal children mostly would have and i think all my friends from northeast would also um, share this uh, is you know uh, when the when uh, the kid joins a school it is neither the mother tongue and in some cases it's not also the language that is spoken uh, locally okay so it could be a third language or it could be a second language and so a kid has a whole lot of difficulties and there are this i mean you know, cognitive issues and psychological issues so therefore these are some of the reasons where in the initial years the students uh, from uh, ethnic minorities because the, their mother tongue also it, it becomes different from the medium of instruction they they they, they lag behind in uh, you know performance the the performance here again is the kind of um, you know, the ways in which um uh, performance is uh, uh, is measured i mean taking exams and how much one has scored but if one did not understand those words i i fail to understand how the kid would uh, perform and um and just quoting what rabindranath tagore has said like now i don't remember what i was taught but i do remember what i learned so at each stage in education one is only able to retain or remember what one learned rather than what was taught so um now from here let me uh, go to my college days and as i was mentioning as i went to south rather than coming to the northern uh, northern destinations of higher education um the assumption of my family was that we would not be so distinctly uh, identifiable and we could be one of the one in the crowd yet i think it was also important that i did a second thing to to dodge the question about my identity i thought like no it was important to be uh, you know performing well in some area or the other and i chose sports to be that area and so then my identity rather than my name and uh, my um, i mean you know, the background in terms of which state i came from 
because I went to Bangalore and moved to Chennai. Now in Chennai, Madras earlier. Uh, nobody would ask me besides uh, no, uh, not recognizing me as a hockey player. So, uh, so that is the, the second thing, a facade sort of thing that I try to bring about in order to avoid the blatant and visible hurdles that could have been, which are uh, loud and prevalent in educational institutions. Well, I did not have to face most, uh, in during my college days, I did not have to face those but I do for, know for sure there is a lot of discrimination in educational institutions, even in Southern Indian institutions. Um, just uh, everybody gets very curious as to what is the, you know, the, the, what, which community one comes from. And there are certain names like, you know, or the, 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 the way the naming is done of individuals that also indicates what social group one comes from. So, you know there are questions after questions besides the uh, you know the effort through of periyar to give away the surname and just to retain the name of the person that that uh, was not adequate um, which aloka did mention the system is discriminating but most in most cases it is the people who are discriminating because it's their uh this it could be a bring it if i talk about my uh the classmates it would be the environment they grew up in you see and that cultures them to think in a way that certain people or individuals coming from certain backgrounds and social groups uh, communities are not equal and they are either higher or they are lower so this hierarchy that gets created in the mind of a child and then as adults also is very very difficult to fight against to do i guess it may be difficult for them to give up to but those of us who are subject to uh, the, the treatments which Shanta was main, uh, mentioning, like maybe in their ignorance, but then part of their ignorance is they also grow up with this inequality in the brain, okay? Individuals not being equal. And this uh, bogs me down. When uh, individuals are so equal, although diverse, as Prav was mentioning, unequal in certain respects, but biologically equal, the constitution also tries to enforce that we are equals and need to treat each other as equal i feel it is the failure of education education system that this uh, mindset or uh, uh, the, 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 this culturation of inequality is uh, uh, is is replaced by these um, uh, you know ethos of equality now having said that uh, you see uh, when I came to join as a faculty earlier on in Bhopal University, but very soon, I mean, before doing much, I moved to Madurai Kamaraj University in South. And um, uh, there again, uh, you know, from there again, I moved to JNU in 1992. So I've spent most of my life, my career and my shaping also. I would like to give uh, acknowledge the environment of JNU. It's me being a student of computer science and faculty of computer science, um, you know, I had interactions with uh, the groups and friends um, who came from social sciences and were constantly debating and talking about the issues in the society, even national and international. But the, the matters and the topics that um, were, were related to me, so, uh, as far as social justice, a matter of social justice is concerned, I would be listening to them and I had I did not uh, try to speak earlier but then uh, when I um, joined as a faculty I think I had to uh, take a very conscious decision and that decision was um, whether I would uh, work very very hard and do uh, excel in my area um, in my career so that I would be known as a computer science or scientist uh, uh, faculty and do some very very innovative and big work but then i thought to myself and i said i'm not going to get a, a turing award for that my work may not be worth a nobel prize and or turing award and if that is not so what is my other option because i was going i was in an institution and i have seen the institutions and uh, uh, the spaces of teaching learning also be um, the spaces of 
discrimination, exploitation, and all these uh, other terms which uh, we would not like to see or uh, uh, witness in a civilized society, especially the society which calls uh, itself educated and evolved. Uh, so then I uh, made a very conscious decision also to not strive towards total excellence according to my parameters, but also to engage uh, with people and in terms of activities in and around me, which would help or which would address or which would engage in talking about issues of social justice. So, I mean, I had to try to strike a balance besides you know, having being a mother also. Uh, to, to, to divide my time prudently that I was also doing what was expected of me uh, with, uh, of teaching and research, but also engage with uh, the, the, the community which was there in my institution, probably uh, another community which was in the city of Delhi because I was in JNU. And, uh, and to talk about these things, and even if I did, did not contribute much, but at least I should be found to be a person who's sensitive and would like to also work towards increasing the sensibility in the communities around. So um, uh, they, having taken that decision, um, I, JNU also provide me, provided me opportunities to engage in, uh, um, you know, and work as a proctor. I was there a, a, a proctor for four years. Uh, we do have a proctor's office and a chief proctor, but I, I was never a chief proctor, however. But then we also, in JNU, after Professor Thorat uh, became a, a chairman of uh, UGC, um, it was also, man each institution is mandated to have a cell or an office that would look into the complaints of students wherever there are caste-based violence or caste abuse and if there are these uh, you know cases of violence or misbehavior because of the social uh, parameters uh, uh, i mean uh, yeah because in gnu we also had something called gs cash to look into the gender part so to, to to address the complaints of sexual harassment but equal opportunity office is what in there in gnu and i was able to um, also take up uh, responsibility there now, so um, we do understand, like, no, there, there are efforts, there are sufficient policies that institutional support be provided to students. Um, and at times, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I would not shy away from stating that such institutional mechanisms also could become a lip service or an eye wash. Because if those who take up responsibilities in such uh, uh, places, if their commitment towards social justice is not there. They could just be you know, uh, spending time there and not doing uh, probably, I mean, uh, the, 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 doing the job they're meant to uh, as an institutional mechanism to extend support, to, to make the environment much more uh, uh, friendly and congenial for towards equality, towards, uh, you, you know, even debating so that we, 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 we are able to shed our um, you know biases and so on and so forth so um, but so, so therefore um, uh, I mean such instant mechanisms are there now um, now as I would like to ask myself more than uh, um, you know just share with you now what because I have, you know now I have it's been as I mentioned 38 days since I joined as a vice chancellor of this university which is in Dumka again a small town with the eastern part of Jharkhand if you look up the map and the six districts of Santhal Bargana uh, have colleges and all the institutions under this university so now what is my task coming to this I would also like to mention uh, yes in certain respects these hurdles are invisible or they are made to look invisible but I would like to mention that the that invisibility of these hurdles is only a perception of the other side because I do remember in JNU it must have been a good three to four years after I had joined one of the very esteemed professors whom I still regard because of his academics, um, he, he told me um, that he said in Hindi, 
कि सर जब तुम मुंह खोलती हो और बोलती हो तो पता नहीं चलता है कि तुम ऐसे बैकग्राउंड से आती हो यू नो आई फाइंड दिस स्टेटमेंट वेरी डेरेगेटरी वेरी इंडिकेटिव एंड वेरी इंडिकेटिव दैट व्हाट ही एक्सपेक्टेड आउट ऑफ एन इंडिविजुअल कमिंग फ्रॉम माय सोशल बैकग्राउंड यू सी सो so where as i have also witnessed which are not invisible is some kind of ghettoization even nepotism and even you know corruption in its uh, you know conceptual forms very intellectually uh, conceptual forms also be present and prevalent in uh, academic spaces and so um i think the moment we acknowledge that uh, hurdles and discrimination hurdles uh, that are uh, that ethnic minorities or uh, groups such as uh, people individuals coming from uh, uh, groups such as tribal communities and etc when they come to a larger arena the hurdles are definitely not invisible they could be because we see like you know the kind of uh, aggressive body language the other the others would have i mean that prevents us from getting assimilated too and therefore there are these pressures to perform and in fact to outperform so that the outperformance of a person coming from such a background would would kind of liberate a person from getting labeled okay and as it was mentioned also mentioned by prabha like you know the reservation is there and not to be diluted yes so this is the challenge i think i'm faced with because this uh, the provision for reservation it has been again systematically all the time used again to continue to deprive the rightful share and what is the constitutional provision and so the correct method of implementation of reservation must be the correct method of implementation of reservation must be the obligation of uh, the, the 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 institutions or i mean of any employer uh, especially if it is a government one now uh, what i have learned that these percentages are different from state they differ from state to state and so therefore each state cannot simply say give it to um, um, to, to the institute and can issue a gazette and said now these are the percentage implement because there are there are this clever and very very cunning ways of implementing it so that the 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 spirit of reservation the spirit of treatment uh, um, and not equal treatment but equity and the the the, the, the representation is continued to be denied and uh, therefore um i feel for me uh, as the vice chancellor of uh, this university for me there is this task that if the that if uh, justice or social justice has to be visible in this university reservation is one of the ways in which uh, that can be uh, that can be done in terms of in terms of acquiring the right or claiming the rightful share by each section of the society which the government or the state government has identified and has allocated now here there is nothing called generosity of one or the other but it is a, it is the constitution which mandates us so therefore there is this, this given this constitutional obligation i think the institutions um, will have to uh, have mechanisms to not only uh, implement reservation but also these mechanisms for support such as equal opportunity office and where there would be people who are interested in resolving uh, the complaints or not addressing the redressing the complaints and if there are certain uh, issues which have come about because of ignorance and um, uh, uh, yeah so then um, uh, uh, bring about reconciliation and etc so that the environment especially the, the environment of the uh, educational institutions become more congenial and more open and i think this is where the uh, the educational institution teaching learning space is where such a um, such a such a uh, such an activity must begin and we cannot expect this environment to begin at home because in a number of uh, discussions and panel discussions i am faced with it shouldn't it begin at home no because 
this is the space where we, I mean, people with diverse backgrounds come. So this is where the, and so academic institutions have, are mandated to have that openness to hear out each other before we, uh, before we get into, you know, uh, further developing biases about each other. Uh, so with these words, I would like to stop and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Professor Mintz. Uh, 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 Professor Kaka, uh, would you continue? Uh, is he around? Uh, he is there. Please unmute yourself, Professor Kaka. Unmute your system. Uh, no, he, I think you. Uh, you you muted yourself again. <laughs> muted and video also gone. Yeah. Yeah. You can also put on your video, uh, Professor yeah, Sarkar. Start video. Huh. Thank you. Stop. Oh. Yeah. You're fine now. Professor Kaka, you can start speaking. Huh? You, you can, can start. start speaking. I can. Achha, achha. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for inducting into this very interesting program. Uh, let me begin with the fact that, uh, you know, I'm not really going to focus much on my own personal experiences, which have been, you know, of varied kinds, because people um, with whom I have worked, they're all around, and I don't really want an, uh, uh, a sort of... Uh, uh, talk about that. But uh, I let me just start with the fact that uh, I grew in an environment of a working class because my parents, they migrated to the states of North Bengal in the 1940s and I'm born and brought up. And my education was primarily in the working class environment. In fact, uh, when I began schooling in the radius of uh, nearly 200 kilometers length and 45 kilometers breadth, there were only two primary schools and only one high school. Not, of course, because my parents were not interested in me to send into Bengali medium schools, because Adivasis by and large in Jharkhand were being educated in Hindi medium, and my parents wanted that I should also go to Hindi medium schools, which were just, as I said, only two primary schools and one high schools in, in a distance of around 200. Uh, what is called uh, kilometers in distance, uh, what's called length and uh, almost 45 kilometers in breadth. Just that one. Now, uh, I let me. I would like to just raise some of the basic general issues. Uh, you know, I think when uh, we are talking about the invisible hurdles, and uh, you know, and uh, Sona has been saying this is not really invisible; it is really obvious. I think we have to also factor. And a different kind of universities because yes it is there but it is not uniform throughout the university you find that in university with just setting being set up a new university probably you find it because people are just moving from different parts of india and making a university so you don't really feel that kind of uh, you know the the, the 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 discrimination of that kind of unwantedness which generally you find so i think we have to factor what is that kind of university? It is a new university. It is an old university. It is a university in the periphery. It is a university in the what is called metropolis. And even in metropolis, you find is this university is well established, long history, where you find that the people who have been teaching there, they have been well settled from coming from certain kinds of backgrounds, or it is a new university. So I think if you really move into these different kind of universities, you will have a different kind of experiences. So I would like to see. The, the problems are there, but the intensity and the, uh, and, and the degree of experiences will vary depending on where one is. Now, I think uh, uh, when we, I come to the questions of the, 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 the uh, uh, what do you call the, my journey. You see, I began at Northeastern University and, uh, you know, when I, I, uh, and I, I just said that I didn't really feel much of the problems in North Central University because it's a new university and it was ethnically very diverse in terms of faculty and students. 
And I think generally what you find is that uh, people who come from a tribal community or ethnic minorities, they prefer to go to an university which is diverse in its character rather than going to an university where you find a domination of a particular linguistic group. So by and large, if you look at Northeastern students, they don't really like to go to universities which, are, which had been there earlier, but they would prefer to go to Hyderabad or they prefer to go to uh, what is called Bangalore or prefer to go to Delhi because you find these institutions are not only better, but you find that they are also are ethnically, culturally very, very diverse and where they can really accommodate. So that I think is an important dimension which we have to take that. Now, when we come to the, my experience is that as a student, I never experienced discrimination. I think I began uh, maybe because I studied in a school which was completely homogeneous in terms of being predominantly for tribal communities. Even in colleges, I think it's small number, so I didn't really experience that. But I think for the first time, I did feel an experience of being a tribal and someone you know, who is different from the dominant community in IIT Kanpur. That was the starting point. But but so when we uh, and began my career as a, as a teacher, and I will basically try to understand university or academia as a teacher. So when we enter into the university, we interact with students, we interact with our own colleagues, and we interact with an administration. And I think uh, when we enter, you know, I think uh, 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 the very fact that coming to an coming from a certain kinds of ethnicity is not that big problem. But coming from an ethnicity which is also so-called quota or reserved category, it becomes a very, very difficult. When I moved to the university because I moved to the university because I thought that was the best as far as the Department of Sociology in India was concerned. Uh, I moved on the same uh, positions because uh, you know I felt that you know to get to move into post of professor, I was not really adequately equipped. But then when I decided to move. marginalized communities or coming from so-called the quota category. So that in fact keeps on reproducing and therefore you find that the, the, the kind of mirror that the, the kind of uh, society that we have that actually gets mirrored also let's say in university. Not only in terms of research but you also will find that in terms of our relationship. See in the university you have a formal relationship, relationship within the class, within the you know, what is called the department, the faculty meeting, etc. But there is also a relationship outside, and that relationship outside is maybe a kind of very informal relationship, going for a tea, going for a lunch, being invited to a house. Now that kind of you know moving from a formal to informal is extremely difficult for students or teachers who really come from let's say a different kind of background. So that therefore we really in in, in informal relationship. You know, we maintain that kind of segregations, which also you find in the kind of society. Now, in case of uh, uh, what is called the discriminations, uh, particularly yes, there is a structural discriminations, but there's also personal discrimination. But I have always found it very, very difficult to associate the personal. Uh, what is called very difficult to find a very strong correlation between the two, because what really happens that. Many of us who come from a different background, we have also experienced, or we have been reading and writing, or others have been experiencing the what is called structural discrimination. So that we really internalize. And whenever something goes wrong, as far as we are concerned, we tend to associate that it is a kind of a, what is called the what is called the systemic discriminations or the structural discriminations. I think personal and uh, what is called the formal, or personal or systemic or structural. The relationship between may be there, but it's extremely difficult to establish the connections between the two. You may as best say that, yeah, there may be, there is some sort of a connection, there will be correlation. But to say that there is a kind of very definite kind of discrimination becomes very, very difficult for me to judge. But because I often think that what I'm really thinking is probably is because of my imagination, because I have really gone into it, I have I've internalized this process, and therefore I tend to think. And therefore I have always found a little 
little difficult in terms of trying to relate the personal discriminations, let's say, vis a vis the structural discriminations. So that's one point that I think is, is the other point that I think we need to find it out is uh, uh, maybe in academia is that more than discrimination, there is something which Sona Dharia was really uh, touching upon it is the is the what is known as a humiliation and humiliation really uh, pervades humiliation let's say which may come from even from the students humiliation may really come from their colleagues and humiliation really comes much more when you add someone coming from a marginalized community you take up an administrative positions either as a chairperson or as a, uh, as, 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 a, as a proctor or as a, let's say a dean or something that is where you find that the what is called the uh, what is called humiliation really becomes very important because mindset is that so far the marginalized com communities have been over which they have exercised authority. Now, when you find that there has been what is called the, the, the opposite of an exercise of authority, you become a person who are exercising authority over others, maybe a students, about the colleagues and others. I think that is where you find a lot of humiliation really comes in. And I had enough of it, particularly in Delhi University, from the administrations, because I took a decision which was in conformity, uh, what you call, with what the traditions of the university I had been. But university uh, authorities just, you know, in a way, uh, what is called, exactly did opposite of what I had recommended. And in the process, I found that, well, uh, I, I was not wanted as a, to run the department. So if I am a chairperson of the department, I must run the department and I'm taking everyone into confidence. And as to why that these things have been, the decisions or recommendations that have been made has been reversed. And I really fought it and I fought it for three, I gave my resignations as a head of the department. I gave a lot of trouble to the university. Eventually they had to reverse the decision, but I had to pay the price. Because I may be the only person in the university being a professor who never became even a member of the governing councils of the colleges. My junior colleagues, they were members of the six, eight, nine different colleges are governing member, but I never could really become a member. Because you find that when you fight, they think you have to pay the prices. And I th think the, 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 the humiliation in academia is, I think, is a pervasive. Sometimes we are able to notice, sometimes it is prolonged, but I think that's what, what really happens. So I think, and this is something which has been there, I uh, think in most of the universities, and I think why it is, uh, happens is that I had this experience also in Tata Institute of Social Sciences. I don't want to really go and discuss in detail, but I had these experiences as an academic uh, who, uh, uh, who had been an administrator, but where because I took the initiative, I took the decision. For example, in case of Tata Institute of Social Sciences, I won giving an advanced notice that I don't want to continue as the deputy director of the campus. And you know, so I'm giving you an advance so that you can choose a suitable candidate, but it didn't happen. Suddenly you find that someone is appointed as the deputy director, he is sent to the, what is called the test, and I am still there, they have, not, uh, they have not relieved me of it, I'm still, my tenure was still the September, and this person goes in the month of June, and he says that I have come here to take over. And, uh, so you find that it becomes a public humiliation, that as someone whose tenure is till the September, in fact, in between really comes, and then when they ask what is my status, then they will say, no, you would only be... So these are the issues which you find that in academia really one goes through it. So what I'm really trying to say is that, you know, the, the general issues that we have is the issues of segregations, which really have been, issues of discriminations which are there but as i said it extremely becomes difficult to establish personal relationship and i think is the humiliations which are actually it really takes place and these are some of the issues which people don't really notice it but i think people who go through this kind of experiences they realize it that these are some of the pervading features of what you may call the invisible hurdles of being in the academia in Having said all that, I'm still very grateful to my university, particularly the university, because I took it as a challenge and grew as an academic precisely because of the challenge. And all my colleagues, in fact, our department were extremely supportive, uh, uh, mentored me, and much of what I am today is largely because of my placement at the School of Economics and the kind of contributions my colleagues really made. So when I'm really making it, I'm not really trying to say that there is nothing good about it. There are also equally very important things that are really happening and which helps you to grow as uh, academics. So thank you very much. I'll stop it here. Uh, so 
so there are there are a couple of questions so uh, there is one for prabhavati um, from preeti uh, so preeti saying that uh, how supportive was jamia in your academic journey uh yeah so i can answer that uh so it was i, I would put it at 50 50 so uh, the uh, the institution as a whole uh it was okay but uh, you know i had i had faculty members teachers who were extremely supportive so that was what saw me who that those were i mean these were the people who helped me but uh, there was discrimination at the level of uh, other teachers and other students uh, the hostel warden for example uh, being very uh, negative and not uh, you know making slight comments and so on so i think the answer is like 50 50 Does that answer the question, Priti? Um, yeah, she says thanks. Uh, any anybody else has any questions? Uh, there was a question for Professor Mins, but she answered it. Uh, 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 Professor Mins, would you like to say something more about it? Uh, about the question that Anand Ratan Arun asked you? professor mins um to my recollection the question was about how important it is for <clears throat> um faculty and even administrative staff coming from uh, this uh, diverse backgrounds you know whether that counts because at the moment iits iams have very low um, uh, yeah uh, number of for uh, people from diverse backgrounds um and especially the you know, ethnic minorities so yes i mean i think this representation is counter to hegemony and this is what i have written and which prasad khaka was also mentioning we see that the, you know the how the hegemony if that is um, it 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 hurts uh, the, the hegemony when the diversity increases so that is one but then the thing is like you know what 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 compels especially the educational institutions to um, um have representation uh, from all uh, social and ethnic backgrounds is um the one is the first thing is the constitution of india okay but what should be the, what must have been the thought or the spirit behind that is because definitely this hegemony was has been the, i mean our thought of only um, Uh, you know the the monopoly over the teaching learning space um by certain sections is definitely not the characteristic of the country and therefore if uh, any any institution which has to display a national characteristic needs to have uh, the representation of all society uh, sections that uh, which in turn also so therefore this 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 helps in the profile of the institution but how does it help so this is the institutional's gain if the representation is there whether obligated by the um, constitution or i mean you know, by one's will of being uh, exercising affirmative action but the second part is whether we um, recognize it or not stood now with uh, uh, well quality education is still a question in villages and rural areas and other places but still more and more children uh, more and more students uh, more and more young people would like to study because it's little more accessible than how it was in my generation and so they are coming up and so they some of them also accordingly uh, reach the higher ed uh, higher educational institutions and that's when they cannot be victims of uh, the kind of stories we have recounted or uh, you know and they can provide that informal in support in the institution to make uh, the the place little more livable for them and you know that the supportive to them so i think uh, representation although is constitutionally mandated it is for the good of the institution to to towards its national character rustic rather than otherwise why don't we call um, the the universities as xyz university and not a national university or not a you know a state university if it is not it does not include people from all uh, the, the communities of that state 
Oh, you know, so I would like to just add to this thing. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Prabhavati says that she would like to comment on Poonam's comment. Um, so uh, do you want me to read out the uh, read out Poonam's comment? Uh, so uh, Poonam, after Shanta and uh, Prabhavati is uh, uh, speaking, uh, Poonam has said that it is clear from Shanta and Prabha's uh, description that gender enhances the kind of discrimination people from Northeast undergo. It is much higher for women from Northeast. Uh, Pravati, you would you said you want to comment about this? Uh, are you there? She's muted. Uh, Ah, yes. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with uh, Poonam's comment. Uh, it is, it's a double, uh, double edged sword, I would say. Uh, so there is, there, there is discrimination based on gender. And so there's a perception, there was at least a perception in Delhi in those days that if you belong to the Northeast, you are, uh, you know, kind of, they will judge you as being immoral for no good reason. So that is one aspect. But the other aspect is that even because, you know, the Northeastern societies are also patriarchal, highly patriarchal, I would say. So there is discrimination there also. So I think the women of the Northeast, yeah, especially in Delhi, uh, all these factors intersect and uh, it, it, can, it can get very hard. Yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Prabhavati. Uh, are there any more questions? So, uh, seems that there are none. Uh, so, uh, Jayashree is asking, did you face these with in the uh, science institutions too? I think it's a, a question to Prabhavati. Yeah, so in the workspace, I do not recollect uh, facing such uh, at least it was not told to me in my face. So uh, I, the answer would be negative. Yeah. If people thought it, I don't know because it was not told to me overtly. So yeah, uh, so I think uh, there are no more questions coming. We have also kind of ext uh, exceeded the time allotted to us uh, but uh, thank you very much to all four of you and uh, I think it it was a, a I mean at least personally to me it it I mean you you know that things exist but when you actually hear them uh, hear people say what they went through it's a completely different experience and uh, so I thank all four of you uh, uh, like and from behalf of all of us and uh, I, uh, Aniket is asking a question uh, to, I think, all four of you, uh, which is that what would be the steps to change the picture in future? So maybe this would be the last question. So uh, any one of you would like to take this? So, I mean, all of you can also take this. Uh, Aloka, here I want to say something which is not really answers to Aniket's question, but what I've seen is that of course, uh, I think discrimination uh, is like something like this. You feel that you're more powerful or the other side is more uh, powerless. That's what is the mindset that that's why they discriminate you. Basically, when in any any place, anywhere, when you see that you are, I mean, you're more powerful or you're superior, then they don't, I mean, at least they don't do discrimination on face. But when they think that somehow you're less powerful or you're, I mean, I'm, in other sense, more dominant, only then they discriminate. So this kind of mindset, and uh, yeah, so mindset should change, only then discrimination should be, uh, would be less. That's what I want to say. Oh, thank you, Shanta. It would be nice if um, uh, the other panelists also make a comment about this question. Uh, it, it's a very important question and it, we would like to know uh, what each of you has to say about this. Yeah, so, uh, so I would like to say something. So I think I had ended uh, my my uh, presentation by 
uh, asking the question, how can we be more inclusive or ethnic minorities? So maybe I'll just repeat what I had said there. So I think uh, uh, Professor Khaka, uh, I think he mentioned about uh, whether there is really relation between personal and structural discrimination. Um, so I, I would say that there is relation, uh, at least on some fronts, it is quite clear that there is relation. For example, the way the Nordistan people have been uh, you know, structurally oppressed, it, it stems from probably the caste system within India and because of which uh, the mindset of the people are already not open to other, other uh, types of ra races. And it, it, it uh, distinctly shows a lack of respect for the people from the Nordistan region, inferior, that considering that they're inferior. And it, uh, it comes out in, in the political arena, in the decisions that the government takes, for example, imposing APSPA, Armed Forces Special Powers Law, uh, Powers Act, sorry, uh, and uh, you know, not engaging the public in decision making. So these are the things where the, it comes to, I think, so it comes from the personal to, to, to the political arena. And I think this is where, I don't know whether they will do it, but the governments have to pay attention to this. And, uh, and I think the people should, you know, at a personal level, uh, when we become friends, people should keep an open mind, you know, try to be less insular. Uh, so that's uh, another thing. And uh, uh, so one, one point which is for people like myself who have become part of academia is to become uh, more proactive in interacting with younger people. I, I would say this is not only for people from Northeast, but maybe uh, you know, faculty members, scientists, academic people, they can look out for people who are, or students who are from disadvantaged uh, communities and pay uh, special attention and at least try to nurture them, give extra attention, help them through. And this is, this is going to feed back into the diversity in, in hiring, you know, in, when, uh, there is often this complaint that uh, uh, universities and institutions, they are looking for people to hire and they say they don't find good people. So I think this, this you know, nurturing aspect can go hand in hand and uh, build up the diversity. So these are the, uh, the comments I have. Thank you, Prabhavati. Um, Professor Mintz, uh, would you like to um, comment on uh, Aniket's question and also, uh, uh, also add to this saying that what are, what can academic institutions do about it? Um, yeah, I think even I had closed my um, you know, interventional deliberation with uh, that saying, um, you know, a simple thing, which is not simple, it is a constitutional mandate a reservation to be implemented, you know, which is if it is implemented, in letter and spirit, then the then only we would begin from educational institutions, academic uh, spheres, to to have the sense of equality and shun the inequalities, even if it is by way of ignorance. Because uh, Shanta had correctly mentioned also, and I didn't want to repeat, that having uh, you know even in curriculum things about. Uh, in, I, I am the vice chancellor of uh, a university called Sidhu Kano Murmu University. Okay, and these are two re uh, the legendary names in this region who started the rebellion against the British uh, Zamindari system and the British uh, in 1855. They were executed also, but history has not recorded those names and we don't see anything about that. So, you see. Now we and who now so therefore unless we have academics who come to the teaching learning space from such spaces, they only will be able to bring these uh, facts. They are not stories; they are facts. And so then you know there will be revision of knowledge, or there would be inclusion in the you know the knowledge system. And so we would be we would develop. Uh, appreciation and respect and dignity of the to the other which is very due 
but simple by being biologically equal that is there that's warranted but still to go a bit beyond you know to 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 be able to shun, shun the inequalities that have been ingrained in in the upbringing also because of the caste system and also this discriminatory treatments so therefore <clears throat> i think for me implementation of reservation in letter and spirit sharing the space which is due to each section of the society has to be the first step and and the universities and institutions provide that space for debate and discussion and hearing out each other each other not only listening from one side and hearing the other but then you know therefore i said discussion and debates so that more and more facts and uh, uh, i mean uh, the, the, and also um, this, uh, the, these debates would open avenues for uh, getting rid of the biases and uh, you know wrong information about each other so two things yes thank you uh, professor khaka uh, would you also would like there's also a comment made about what you had said and if you would like to elaborate on that i could also come to the other speakers about the comment uh, professor kaka he still muted uh, uh as far as the reservation is concerned you see in india so called affirmative action program which are prevalent let's say united states or other parts of the world will not work because i think the caste system is so pervasive in our life it is in our vein and therefore often they used to ask me is that what about affirmative action program don't you believe i said i believe it maybe few people will say that well all things be equal preference will be given to this candidate but large chunk of people will not take that as so you think in, if you really want to become a more inclusive kind of a society more inclusive academics then i think reservation is unavoidable one has to really take it up and it is only because of the reservations today that people have today become a part of the university you know whether you talk of the tribals or dalits if there was no reservations i don't think because after all moving into any uh, what is called education you need a minimum requirement it's not a charity it's not like politics that well you know without even uh, your any kind of qualifications other you can really contest but going into the state employment or employment or the universities is requires certain kinds of qualifications and i think one of the biggest problem that we have is because of the accumulated disadvantages that we come through because from our schools from our uh, primary school to high school to colleges and so on so forth that's i think is the reason as to why sometimes we are unable to you know uh, be at par with the others so it is not because that there is inherent problem in, in, in the student it is because of the accumulated disadvantages that has uh, has gone into his his whole character in his own personality and that i think is the reason now as far as the what is to university what university has to do it i think to my mind uh, if uh, the problem is that as i was saying that you know it is in a civil society there is so much of keeping distance particularly the people who are considered as dalit or adivasi and so on so forth now when those very people come to university we do tend to produce that kind of an structure within university now the question is is it possible you know to mentor them to nurture them because i know it that even the most radical uh, faculty will be all for reservations but when it comes to supervising him as a student as a phd or mphil they will all try to avoid it because they think that they have to work a lot he is not really good in english he is ill equipped and so on and so forth so until we address that problem you know we are really going to have a, 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 what is called a problem of getting a better qualified candidates let's say from a kind of i think what is needed is a mentoring and grooming which unfortunately you find in university system doesn't really exist and that is what i think is the most important thing that any university or any institution need to do it uh thank you um professor kaka uh, there is a comment on uh, facebook by uh, chainika shah i'll read out the comment uh, and then uh, maybe the speakers could give a comment on that so uh, chainika says that i think what professor kaka says is crucial the crux uh, for the individual there is always a dilemma of whether there is a personal or structural 
So in some sense, there's a responsibility of the institution to communicate through policies and actions, how they're actively countering the structural. Wonder, so um, could the uh, speakers make a comment about this? I think I have already made it, and it, you know, maybe the policies uh, uh, will help. But the problem is that we have not even studied this. You know, as academics, we have not even tried to understand as to what are the kinds of issues which are there. So even this kind of relationship between personal and systemic, have we ever tried to do a research on it at different universities? We do have not really done and tried to arrive at any kind of an understanding of it. So we, as of now, we are just talking about the experiences and experiences varies from people to people. So unless we have a well uh, a structured, systematized study on this, I think we will still be talking about it, whether there is a kind of relationship in personal and the structural. That will always remain a kind of debate. And someone may say, question known, it is not personal, it is not intentional. But I, as, uh, I, I, as uh, someone who is, uh, uh, what is called the, the, the experience i will say no no it is an experience so that debate will continue we will not be able to arrive at a kind of a coherent understanding of the kind of relationship between the two this is what i was trying to say uh, professor uh, Mintz? No, I think Professor Khaka has uh, summarized it well and uh, he's articulated it well. Um, I, I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't want to speak for uh, Prabha and uh, Hanta, but like, no, see, I'm from computer science and mathematics and I mean, the, 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 the study of social systems requires a different kind of attitude and training. So, so to be able to, I mean, I really present it in a very structural way, uh, yeah, it's difficult, but then uh, you know, the way I have done it, I mean, I've taken on challenges and uh, whatever task which is ahead of me to, you know, gone one after the other, so taken them one, one at a time. So, yes, these are, uh, they need to be addressed, but then there needs to be a study to help uh, do a very structured and uh, 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 yeah, for that, provision for that. Um, thank you. Uh, Shanta, uh, would you like to add? Yes, actually, uh, I guess that I guess all of you know every university or institute has this SCST cell or OVC cell or I mean any minority cell, whatever you call it. Uh, so I guess the, if the institution wants to actively count, I mean, at a structure level, they want to do it, then they can involve these cells and uh, sort of try to have a mechanism to address this issue. I don't, I mean, as far as I know, I think many of the cells, I'm, I think, uh, instead of, I mean, uh, many of the cells, I don't know how do they function because I've not been part of any of these things, but I know that they exist. So maybe through them or with the help of them, I think some way could be done by the institutions. That's what I just want to say. Thanks, Shanta. Uh, Prabhavati, uh, would yeah, you so, want to... Yes, yes. So I think Professor Kaka has articulated it very well. Uh, yes, I would certainly love to see a well-researched quantification of whether there is a correlation. And uh, I look forward to seeing it from, I don't know, some of the young people or senior people in social science. Unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, I'm not equipped to do such a study. Thank you, Prabhavati. Uh, there is, uh, and I, I think this is, this will be the last uh, comment to give, um, uh, last question to take up. Uh, so, uh, Pooja is asking uh, um, to know if there are systematic mentoring programs and ideas for the same for Dalit and Adivasi students, which may be underway, uh, underway in other institution, educational institutes. Do any of you have any leads about it? Uh, mentoring, um, systematic mentoring programs. Uh, you see, I think uh, uh, there have been uh, many universities where they do uh, take some sort of uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, program to mentor or to tackle these problems. But the problem is that uh, it becomes too obvious. When you are trying to say as to how to address, sometimes you put it in the notice board, 
and uh, in the notice board becomes so obvious that everyone sees and they are trying to say that well you know the issues of the dalits or adivasis or the others really being taken being taken care of so that actually again reinforces that kind of uh, kind of uh, you know coming from you know the 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 the, the uh, uh, let's say quota category and so so this goes on so it becomes very difficult uh, you know uh, uh, we did try to have a personal mentoring personal mentoring yes but then personal mentoring will go to a certain level beyond that it doesn't really help so whether you do it as individual teacher vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular student or whether you do as a collective collective becomes a little problem because it exposes them of coming from certain kinds of which of course people know about it but people themselves are shy of joining so at the individual level where probably there is a possibility that if you find an individual teacher is being assigned a particular student to mentor him and it, he or she really takes it very very seriously probably that is one of the ways in which this can really be addressed in my opinion that's what i think yeah here i just want to tell that iits used to have this one year preparatory course for students from scst communities like who couldn't really clear but who who is to get reasonable marks and they were trained for a year and again made to appear before this exam. So I, I don't know how much it helps them, but uh, I mean, so, such kind of things could be a probably also introduced to uh, different educational institutions. But then, of course, there has to be proper mentoring uh, for, for these students. That's one point. People will go when they are looking for admission. Maybe IITs, then they will go for coaching classes or this kind of. But once they are within the university and you want to address this, then they are a little wary of going in a collective way. So that's what I was trying to say. Okay. okay. Yeah, I agree. That's true. Yes. Uh, Prabhavati, Professor Mintz. Uh... Yeah, I don't have anything more to add. Yeah. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> so, um, I, I would really like to thank all the panelists and, and all the uh, people who attended this meeting. I, I think it was a very good meeting. Uh, and uh, I personally, I think I took away a lot of things from it. So, uh, thank you very much. And... Uh, I think we can uh, close this. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aloka. Thanks, Shanta. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye, bye Our next meeting will be, uh, will cover a new issue. We are uh, we will uh, make announcement in couple of days. Uh, it may be either the second part of the cast uh, related uh, discussion or we will uh, announce a new session in couple of days. Thank you all. Thank you.